All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you today. For those of you I have not met yet, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here at Aletheia. We are in the middle of a teaching series entitled Image and Identity. And behind this series is one very simple question. What does it mean to be human? We kicked it off last week and we saw what is the foundational biblical idea behind what it means to be a human, namely that we are imagers of God. And I want to encourage you, if you weren't with us last, last week, to go back uh, on the website and have a listen to it because it kind of provides the, the foundational bedrock on which all of the other topics are based. That in our humaning, doing it well means doing a good job of imaging God's character into the world, and doing it poorly means a failure to do that. So today we are going to turn to 1 John chapter 1. You can go ahead and turn there in your Bible or in a Bible app. 1 John chapter 1, it's kind of towards the end of your Bible. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, if you're following along in a Bible app, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. So if you select that translation on your Bible app, you'll be able to follow along word for word. And we're going to read verse 5 of chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. So 1 John 1, verse 5 through 2, verse 2. I'll read for us, I'll pray, and then we will dive in. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, While we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. To pray and ask that he would guide us in it t- today. Heavenly Father, we want to bear your image in the world. We can't do it alone. We need your help. So would you help lead and guide us by your spirit today? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, John. Some kind of weird f- fuzziness going on. All right. So, um, my daughter has a funny habit recently. I have a young daughter. She's five years old, about to be six. And she has neatly divided the world into good people and bad people. And she'll constantly say things along the lines of, oh, dad, bad people would do this, but not good people. And it's interesting As her dad, I want to help bring her into the reality of the world. So it really kind of rocked her boat the other day when I said to her, you know, Delzy, we're all bad people. (laughs) She was like, I don't think she still quite gets it. But isn't it true that as a child, we have a tendency to divide neatly the world into good people and bad people. And then as you become an adult, you realize, oh, it's not that simple that there is the capacity for good and for bad inside of each of us. And at times it's surprising and unpleasant and a little bit embarrassing. But then it gets even more complicated because when you become a Christian, two things are true at once. That you're a new kind of thing. You're a new creation, which is what the Bible says. And yet, the old life and the old you rears its ugly head at times in your life. Old habits, old addictions, old preferences, old dark corners of your life can crop up in your new life somehow. There's this 
continuity and discontinuity, even when you become a Christian. So the question is, how do you deal with that? How are you supposed to handle that when you're walking out this you know, new life of victory in Jesus, and then you find in yourself something really ugly that you're capable of doing? Well, one way to handle it, which is not a good idea, is summed up in the word license, that you basically say, well, I'm a Christian, I've got a get-out-of-jail-free card, so basically whatever I do is completely fine. I don't recommend that. Um, but the other side of it could be summed up in the word legalism, which is bearing a crushing weight every time you do anything wrong, because you should know better. And if you live under that crushing weight, the likelihood is you'll, well, you'll, you'll simply keep your life guarded from anybody and actually not let anybody inside and see what's truly going on. In John's language, what he would say we ought to do in the reality of being saved sinners is that saved sinners walk in the light. There's a weird tension in this life that to be truly human is to be a saved sinner. And what you do is that you walk in the light. This, this is one of John's favorite metaphors and images. It's present in the Gospel of John, which the same author wrote. It's prevalent in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's one of his favorite metaphors. So the question is, what does the metaphor actually mean? Well, when it comes to the fact that saved sinners walk in the light, three things we can observe out of this passage. That saved sinners first uh, walk in the light by rejecting something. Second, they walk in the light by practicing something. And third, they walk in the light by receiving something. Practicing, uh, rejecting something, practicing something, receiving something. So first, saved sinners walk in the light by, by rejecting something. There are three, three, three times John says this if we say statement. And a little Bible reading tip, anytime you notice recurrence and repetition like that, pay attention. It's one, of the way that the, it's one of the ways that the biblical authors are trying to draw our attention to the theme that they're trying to get across. So there are these three sets of, if we say this, then this. If we say this, then this. Let's look at them in turn. Because here's the first one that John says we must reject. Verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, God... While we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So we need to understand what he's talking about with these metaphors. What is light and what is darkness? Well, a little bit later on, it becomes very clear that he's talking about sin. Darkness is sin. So what is he saying? If we say we have fellowship with God, if we say I'm walking with God, our relationship is good, while we actively, habitually are sinning without repenting, we lie, and we don't practice the truth. Now, there, there's a... Well, let me put it to you like this. If I tell you my wife and I have a great marriage, like our relationship is great, and yet day after day, week after week, I'm doing things to break her heart and to offend her and to betray her re relationally, when I say we have a great marriage or we have a great relationship, I am lying. And the same is true when it comes to God. If you say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I, like I have relationship with God. And yet there are things in your life that you know to be sin, and rather than turning away from them, you're persisting in them, well, you're lying. And I think what it shows us is if we think in that way, it shows us that we've got an unrelational concept of God. We might say, oh, well, it's the universe, it's the force, it's the greater something. Well, that's super convenient because you can sin against the universe and the universe, the formless ame amoeba, <laughs> whatever that is, well, it can't get offended because it's an it. But God, the same God who has extended the olive branch of relationship to human beings is a relational being. From eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, and God the, whole, and God the Holy Spirit have lived in fellowship with one another. And do you know what never happened in that relationship? The Holy Spirit, like, offending the Father or 
Jesus, the Son, offending the Father and saying, oh yeah, we're good. No, it's a perfect fellowship. And so he has invited us into that fellowship. And, and if we say, oh, our relationship is great. You know, my, my relationship with God is wonderful. And yet day after day, there is habitual and persistent sin that you're not actively looking to uproot. You lie and don't practice the truth. I should have warned you that this is going to be a heavy topic. I can see y'all look a little bit shell-shocked. So, for, meant to warn you, forgot. Sorry. So that's, the, that's just the first of three, if we say statements. Buckle up. All right. Here's, here's the second one, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin. Now, this is kind of an odd one. I, I would say this, this if we say statement is the one that's, a little, that's most difficult to figure out of the three. Because the likelihood is you don't have friends who walk around and saying, oh, I'm perfect. Like, I, I just, you know, everything I do is absolutely wonderful and perfect. I never make any mistakes ever. No, I think rather what, what we do culturally speaking is we reinterpret sin. And here's what I mean. I was walking around in Lowe's the other day. Um, and a song came on, and the kind of the tagline in the chorus says, I'm broken and it's beautiful. I'm broken and it's beautiful. I think it's like Kelly Clarkson or something like that. So <laughs> Kelly, no, no direct, you know, I don't, I don't mean offense directly, but I do think your lyric is warped, and here's why. As she's saying, I'm broken and it's beautiful, I'm broken and it's beautiful, I'm broken and it's beautiful. I'm just thinking, well, this, I don't think that's true. And I thought, okay, going into somebody's home and you take a priceless vase, like maybe it's a family heirloom that's holding flowers, and you take it and you smash it on the ground and you break it. Is that beautiful? Like, no. And for us to say that brokenness is beautiful is a contradiction in terms. You don't break your arm and say, wow, what a beautiful arm. This is so good. This is really helping my life. You know, I, yeah, this is great. No. But this is what can happen. We can come to reinterpret terms, calling that which is bad, good, and calling that which is good, bad. And now do you see how prevalent this actually is? And if we take something that the Scriptures call sin and begin to, no, that's actually a good thing. That's actually a good thing. John says we deceive ourselves. We actively warp our own picture of reality. And who knows, like, that's not a good idea. It's a terrible idea. So that's number two. Number three, if we say, and then in verse 10 he says this, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, this can operate on two different levels. Sometimes when I'm talking to people about Jesus and about Christianity, and I'll tell them, you know, 1 Corinthians 15 sums up what Christianity is all about. It says that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And I'll explain, like, all of the wrong actions we have made against God and against other people, Jesus came to pay the debt that those actions had incurred. And sometimes there's this look of offense, as if I have said something that, like, how dare you? <laughs> How dare you say, but, okay, hold on, hold on. If you're honest and you look back in your life at things you've done, ways you've treated people, have you lived up to even your own standards? Things that you get really angry with that other people do, have you always stuck to that path yourself? When you get really angry at, your, at this, I don't know, whatever, this business that lied to you, have you always told the truth to your friends and to your family? Have you always truthfully represented yourself? I think if you're honest, you'll recognize, oh, mm, I have sinned. So at one level, to say I have sinned is an admission of what is true about your past. But I think the second level is also really important. If you say I have not sinned, in other words, if you dilute the the intensity of past sin 
and you say, I'm simply going to let bygones be bygones and not deal with that. I know I betrayed that person 10 years ago, but you know, time heals all wounds. You will not find that in the Bible. If we try and look at things we've done in the past and say, I don't actually need to deal with that, well, John says we make God a liar. How do we make him a liar? Well, God has said in his word that sin is a very serious, very real thing. In fact, it's so real and so serious that Jesus died on a cross for it. That's how serious it is. But I have a tendency, I'll be honest, to kind of look back, oh, the further, the, the further I, I am away from a relational betrayal or a sin against God, well, it, it's not that big a deal. And John would say, oh, no. That's not walking in the light. John says here, to walk in the light, you have to actively reject all of those lies. The lie that says, I can have fellowship with God while I persist in unrepentant sin. The lie that says, I can reinterpret sin according to cultural or my own standards. And the lie that says, no, I don't need to deal with sin from my past. Walking in the light is rejecting those very popular ways to think and talk about sin. Then that brings us to our second point. Saved sinners walk in the light by practicing something. By practicing something. So John gave us the don't do this, but do this. So look at what he says. Up in verse 6, he says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So what's implied is that we, we have fellowship with him by what? By practicing the truth. Practicing the truth. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's just use a simple example. Um, I, like from a young age, we learned that lying is a bad thing, right? That's one of the first lessons I've had to teach my kids. Why? Because they're so good at lying, like, it blows my mind. <laughs> I, I saw you do that, and you walk 20 feet, and I ask you directly to your face, did you do this? And you say, no. I'm like, wow. My kids are better at lying than adults are. It's amazing. So from a very young age, we learn, no, 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 it is bad to lie. Because we know if you don't, if, if you don't live a truthful life, it will erode the pillars of your life. Like you can't operate that way in a family. You can't operate that way in friendships. You can't operate that way in business or in culture or in society. Like a lot of sociologists have asked the question, like why did the Soviet Union fall? And one of the most interesting answers to me is people just couldn't trust each other. They were trained to inform on one another and The truth was so misrepresented all the time that it just kind of crumbled from within, which I think is a really good good illustration for what lies do. So what does John want us to do? He wants to practice. He he wants us to practice what is true. Now, I came up with a couple of examples, and I'm just going to read them to you. And maybe as a way to think about it, think, think about it like this. As a fish was made for water... You were made for a holy life. And if you live a holy life intentionally, you're being truly human. So, a couple of examples. The truth is, the quality of your friendships depends on you being honest and caring and rejecting gossip. That's the truth. If you live in that way, honest, caring, and rejecting gossip, your friendships will be stronger and better. Here's another one. The truth is, the environment in your neighborhood depends on you doing, on, on you doing right by your neighbors. How you treat people around you will directly affect the quality of those relationships. Here's another one. The truth is, alcohol is only good when used in moderation for celebration and enjoyment, not for drunkenness. Here's another. The truth is your body wasn't made for sexual immorality. Sex enjoyed in a marriage is a wonderful gift. Used any other way, it's a destructive curse 
that actually makes you statistically more likely to destroy your romantic relationships. I made that one a little bit longer because I think when it comes to sex, we have one of the greatest tendencies to reinterpret the, the truth. And even when, like a, a few months ago, I told you some statistics about sexual immorality, we have an enormous capacity to look at those statistics and to say, nope, nope, no, but... You are called to live a holy life. And when you live a holy life, you are being truly human. You're walking in the light. And I love this metaphor of walking in the light. Both John and Jesus in the Gospels, they use this phrase kind of, um, what's the word, like practically. Like, yes, walking in the light has this kind of ethereal beauty about it. But walking in the light is also helpful. Like I've told you many times in the sermon, I have young kids. If you try and walk down a hallway in a house with young kids in the dark, watch out. Le- you know, Lego, toys, cars, Lightning McQueen. It's like your, your feet are in for a world of hurt. This is kind of how John is using this. When you walk in the darkness, you stumble, you trip over things, you lose your way, you're misdirected. When you walk in the light, you're able to see clearly. You're able to to live out the calling that God has for you. You're able to live a life of purpose and direction. And you're like, Paul says, let us lay aside every weight that hinders us from the purposes of God. Walking in the light is how you do that. So the question is, what do you do then when sin rears its ugly head? John tells us very clearly. So he just said in verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. Then verse 9, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do you do when sin rears its ugly head? You confess. Now, confession is owning your sin, not ignoring it, not reinterpreting it, not hoping it will go away with time. Repentance is owning your sin. And I believe that you have to own it in two relational capacities. You have to own it with God, and you have to own it with others. First, here's what I mean. You have to own your sin before God. In Psalm 51, Maybe you remember the story. Um, David has just committed some serious sin. He committed adultery with, uh, with a woman named Bathsheba, and then he had her husband murdered because he had the power to do it. That is some pretty heinous sin. It's terrible. In Psalm 51, he writes a psalm of confession. And it's interesting. At one point, he says this, which is a bit counterintuitive. He says, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. To be honest, the first time I read that, I was like, David, you did not only sin against the Lord. You know, Uriah would beg to differ. But what is he saying? It's a, it's a phrase that is meant to be um, comparative in terms. That sin is fundamentally against God. Because... God gave you that body, like God gave David not only his body and his hands and his life and his breath, he gave him his reign and his throne, his position, his relationships, and he used the very resources God had given him to commit terrible sin. So at core, fundamentally, his sin was against God. And that's why he says, against you and you only, Lord, have I sinned. Every sin is fundamentally against God. And we, first and foremost, have to own that sin in front of God. And the Bible makes a distinction between um, godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow says, I'm sorry I have broken God's heart. I'm sorry that I have relationally betrayed my Creator. Worldly sorrow says, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry you know, my career is ruined. Because this part of my life came into the light. Godly sorrow says, in ways small and large, I broke God's heart. 
And that is a terrible thing. We must own our sin before God, but we must also own our sin before others. In James 5.16, James says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. Why do we need to confess our sins before one another? Wouldn't it be more convenient just to like, Lord, I'll confess this to you, but I don't need anybody else to know. Like, why do the scriptures lead us to do that with other people? First, I, I think we need other people's help to walk in the light. I think you need the help of brothers and sisters in Christ if you are going to habitually live a holy life. You can't do it alone. This is why people in your small group are really important. Because they come around you and they help you live a holy life. They, they help keep you on the path of righteousness. Then the second reason is that oftentimes sin is against other people. And you need to own that in front of other people. You need to go to the person that you have wronged and not say, I'm sorry you felt that way. I'm sorry you felt offended. Say, no, I sinned. It hurt you. I'm sorry. Own it. Don't reason it away. Don't say, oh yeah, you know, when I was five, I had this bad experience and I'm probably acting. No, no, no. Stop doing that. Own it. It's sin. It's against God and it's against others. And when we go to somebody and we say, I hurt you. It was my fault. I'm sorry. Even if the entire pie is not yours. Here's what I mean. In some relationships, if you picture it like a pizza, like two slices out of the eight are yours. Six are that person's. So what? Own your two slices. Go to that person and don't go to that person and be like, I'll apologize if they own their six slices. No. Own your sin. Own your sin. Confess your sin before God and others. We must practice the truth. We must practice walking in the light and practice confession. Now, here's what you know, because I know it too. That's hard. It is embarrassing and difficult to go and own your sin in front of somebody. So this brings us to our third point, that saved sinners walk in the light by receiving something. In chapter 2 and verse 1, here's what John says. My little children... I love that, pa that pastoral phrase. John is a good pastor. He loves these people. And he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, just look at that tension for a second. He says, I don't want you to sin. Sin is going to ruin your life. But if anyone does sin, this helps us to avoid giving, you know, Painting sin is not a serious thing, but it also helps us to avoid severity. In this church, we ought to be able to hold the tension of sin is a terrible thing. And when you sin, you can confess. Those two things are true at once. Why does he say we can actually confess? If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. John tells us two things about Jesus. He says he's our advocate, and he's our propitiation. The word advocate is the same word that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit in the, in the Gospel of John. It means someone who comes alongside and speaks on behalf of. And in its ancient use, it was most often talked about as like a legal advocate. Now, this might bring up images of like, wait, God the Father is accusing me and Jesus is defending me. No, that's, that's not a biblical concept. It means that Jesus is our plea for mercy. Isn't it true that that's what we need? In the moments that we sin, following Jesus for two weeks or 20 years, when we sin, what do we need from God? Mercy. Mercy. And Jesus is our appeal for mercy, but he's also the one who secures it. He's our advocate and he's our propitiation. What is propitiation? It's in reference to what would happen in the animal sacrificial system. It means that which takes away sin. That the payment is made. And when Jesus Christ came into the world 
and went to the cross. He was dying on our behalf so that our sin could be forgiven. Here's what that means. When you confess your sin, Jesus is both your appeal for mercy and he is the one who has secured it for you. It is done. You know how sometimes you go and apologize to someone, you don't know how they're going to respond. And it doesn't go pretty all the time. With God, you know how he's going to respond. He has extended mercy in the person of Jesus Christ. You have it. This is why you can confess your sin. You're like, oh, pastor, you, you don't know. It's been 15 years. Yeah, but you know what God has offered you. Mercy. And that's what you need. I, just yesterday, I, um, I, needed, mer- mer- I needed mercy from my own daughter. I, uh, my daughter and my son were in the living room. My son fell over. I looked over, and it looked as, as if Della had pushed him. And I was frustrated. I was working on a home project that was taking too long, and I was frustrated. And I just jumped to conclusions, and I went and disciplined her immediately. And it turns out that it wasn't her fault. Nolan just tripped over something and fell. And I felt so bad. Went up to her room, had a conversation. Here I am, you know, a 36-year-old man, but what do I need from this five-year-old girl? Mercy. I had done wrong by her. Here, here's what I love. Well, not what I love. Here, here's the thing I thought in the moment. She's five. I could reason this away. Be like, well, you've done enough things today to deserve many more, di- many more acts of discipline. Because <laughs> I could have done that. Could have said, oh, it wasn't that bad. Could have reasoned it away. Um, and we can do the same thing with our sin. But the truth is, she would probably have been hurt at me the entire day. And the only way to truly heal that relationship was for me to go up and to own it, to say, I did not do right by you. I'm sorry. Graciously, she extended me, she extended me mercy. And I'm very grateful. But here's what's even more amazing. The God who made you and who redeemed you by the blood of his son has extended you mercy for all your sin. That's the good news of the gospel. That's what Jesus came to do. And here's what John tells us. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Do you realize that when you habitually walk in righteousness, your fellowship with God and your fellowship with others is cultivated, it's nourished, it grows, it strengthens. You want to have great friendships? You want to have great family relationships and a great marriage? Learn to walk in the light. Learn to confess your sin. That is how you have strong relationships. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Some of you are walking around with guilt and shame from stuff you did years ago. And you're thinking, well, this is just going to be part of my life. No. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God, who made you who your sin is fundamentally against, has extended you mercy if you'll receive that invitation. Here's what I want to do. We're, you know, obviously, this is so, sobering stuff. As we begin to come to the bread and the cup, we're going to create a moment in which we can do some business with Jesus in our hearts. Maybe you're in here and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. John is talking to Christians, and he says, we have an advocate with the Father. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, you do not have an advocate with the Father. You're still in your sin, and you have no grounds for mercy. God has extended you mercy in Jesus Christ. Our prayer team is going to be on the side of the room, and here's what I would encourage you to do. The best thing you could do is go and pray with them and say, I need to put my faith in Jesus to receive his mercy over my sin. Maybe you're in here. And you're not walking in the light. You say you're walking in the light. You say my relationship with God is good, but there is habitual sin in your life right now. And you've thought, well, nobody knows. It's fine. God knows. God knows. And before any relational reconciliation 
can and should happen, I want you to do business with God this morning. I want you to go pray with our prayer team and say, I need to confess this. I need, as James says, I need to be prayed for so that I can be healed. God wants to have fellowship with you. But you've got to confess your sin. You've got to own it before him and before others. Maybe there are some people that after service today, you need a call and you need, you need to own your sin in front of them. Not reason it away. Say, I've done you wrong. I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as we come into our moment of communion, the Apostle Paul says this, and I, I really want to encourage you, like, we take communion every week. Sometimes it can become a bit rote. Being like, oh yeah, this is what I do. Look at what the Apostle Paul says about this moment. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of Jesus. Let a person therefore examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is a moment for us to discern the body, to examine ourselves. To examine yourself. And we're going to take a moment. The band is not coming up. We're just going to play some music over the speakers. I want you to take your time. Sometimes we just jump up communion, which, by the way, we need to slow down. We can't even say the body and the blood of Christ over you fast enough. Just like, take a moment, okay? Just like, stand back there, wait for the person to go, walk up, let us say the body and the blood of Jesus, give them for you, and then go. All right, some of y'all are running past. But more importantly, take a moment to examine yourself. Do what the scriptures invite you to do in this moment. This is a moment to discern the body. Our prayer team is going to be on the side of the room. Go and pray with them for whatever you need. Don't miss this moment. Jesus has given you this moment so that you can walk in the light. Some of you have been walking in darkness the entire week. I want to see you leave this room walking in the light. Receive the mercy of Jesus over you. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, this is good news. Tough news, but good news. Lord, may we be a people who walk in the light who receive the fellowship with you and with others as the incredible gift that it is, and who readily confess sin. Lord, I pray over my brothers and sisters in this room, would you grant them the boldness to do what needs to be done in this moment, right here, right now. In view of what Jesus has done through his shed blood and his broken body, we respond in a fitting way, confessing sin, practicing the truth, walking in the light, for you are light and in you there is no darkness at all. In Jesus' name, amen.